Hi, this is Patrick Conway. Thanks for having me here today, and uh, thanks for, for all the collaboration we've had in the developing this model. Um, I will just hit some highlights on the Innovation Center quickly to start and then turn it over to Aaron. As you all know, historically we have a state that's more producer-centered, volume-driven, unsustainable, fragmented care. We're really trying to work with the private and the public sector to get an, to an ideal future state that's people-centered, outcomes-driven, sustainable, and coordinated care. And we're using an array of new payment systems and policies to get there listed on the bottom right-hand side of the slide, everything from value-based purchasing to ACOs to specialty models, which we'll talk about today. Um, this slide you certainly don't need to read the details of, but talks about category of payment, category one being fee-for-service with no link to quality, category two a fee-for-service with a link to quality and efficiency such as value-based purchasing, category three being alternative payment models such as bundles or episode-based payments or ACOs with shared savings, and then category four being population-based payments. At CMS, we're moving increasingly to testing alternative payment models, so category three and four, uh, that move away from fee-for-service. And in category two, we're trying to increase the percent uh, tied to quality measures in the fee-for-service system. The innovation at CMS, uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, established by the Affordable Care Act, testing new payment and service delivery models focused on Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP programs. The goal is to test models that will improve quality and outcomes for charities, also lower, lower costs. On this next slide, you can just see our uh, entire portfolio. I won't go through this slide in detail, but everything from ACOs to primary care transformation to bundled payment uh, to state innovation products to, uh, and models um, and Medicaid and dual eligible uh, models as well. Uh, the next slide just talks about uh, we started in our episode-based payments uh, working on a bundled payment for care improvement model, or CP BPCI. Uh, this focuses on episode-based payments in the acute care, post-acute, and post-acute alone space. We really applied many of those learnings as we think about specialty models. Uh, we have over 40 conditions and bundles, uh, hundreds of participants and growing, actually thousands of interested participants now. Um, and it really allows providers to innovate, remove waste from the system, and most importantly, imp focus on improved quality and patient experience for beneficiaries. Our specialty models, um, we uh, began uh, looking at specialty model development um, a little over a year ago in a significant way. Uh, it all, and the Innovation Center is interested in testing new models that focus on specific diseases, patient populations, and specialty practitioners. Uh, we've heard from many specialists that they want to move towards alternative payment models and away from fee-for-service, but they need to see the pathway uh, to move in that direction. So we are trying to enable uh, specialists to do that. On the next slide, and just to frame this up, I should say uh, Aaron is going to talk about some of the details of what we heard on the oncology model. Uh, this is uh, what we've heard from technical expert panels, from CAP, uh, from others who have given us input. You know, we do not have an announced model on the, uh, for people to apply to. To do that, we would go through a public process and a clearance process for that to be posted. We are not at that position now. We are interacting with stakeholders and trying to share what we've heard uh, might be a successful design for an oncology model. Um, so in terms of oncology, uh, you all know this information, so I won't go through it in detail, but huge impact both in terms of quality and cost uh, for the Medicare program and its beneficiaries. Um, and then uh, I'll just do this first slide and then turn it over to Aaron. We are uh, looking at an oncology care model, or OCM. Really the goal is to focus on better care for patients, care coordination, appropriateness care, and access to the appropriate chemotherapy. And we're trying to put financial incentives in place that would encourage practices to collaboratively improve care for patients, improve quality, and lower cost overall for the system. So with that, I will turn it over to Aaron to discuss the details of what we've heard uh, from others about what the model maybe should look like. Aaron? Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so this first slide here on OCM, as we, we kind of coined it for now, as it is a still pr pr preliminary design of a model, in which we're still getting feedback from external stakeholders and in internal folks as well. 
But this frames out the model as we see it now, and it's framed out as an episode-based model, meaning that we would design a payment for a specific amount of time. And that time period right now is six-month periods following the initiation of chemotherapy. And with that said, we're also emphasizing practice transformation. And so we have laid out some practice requirements that we think will really transform healthcare delivery and also achieve savings. And then with that said, in order to create practice transformation at a higher level and not just for Medicare beneficiaries, we think it's critical, as Zeke was saying earlier as well, to include other payers in this model. And so what we'd be looking for is support from other payers, um, whether those be commercial payers, um, potentially Medicaid uh, managed care organizations or others, to also be incentivizing the same types of care transformation and the same types of payment incentives for that care transformation in order to really create a better value proposition for the practices. So the participants that we would have in this model would be the actual physician practices. And we started receiving some questions about what does that mean for practices that are based in a hospital. We would also be encouraging practices that practice in other settings to apply for this model as well. But the applicant and the participant in the model would be that physician practice because we really do think the source of change here and the, the folks who really have control over care transformation are the physicians who are um, managing the care for the chemotherapy patients. And the key places where we are now thinking uh, where we want to incentivize this care transformation are in about six different practice requirements. So not all of these things would be true in the baseline period or in a historical period, but beginning at the start of a performance period, we would like the practices to move and transition to this type of care delivery. And those would be um, following nationally recognized clinical guidelines, understanding that that's not always going to be the case. We'd be asking people to explain to us whenever that's not possible or not appropriate for a patient. Um, providing and attesting to 24-7 access for the patients, and that's access to um, a practitioner who actually can access in real time that patient's medical record. Um, we would be asking practices to initiate and start moving towards stage two of meaningful use for um, an ONC certified EHR system. And this isn't something that we'd be requiring in the first year, but gradually progressing to that and having that in place by the fourth year. We, CMS, uh, typically in our models provide a lot of claims data to our practices, and we would be doing that in this case and asking them to actually utilize that data, process the data, and use it for their continuous quality improvement. The next requirement would be employing um, a patient navigator or care coordinator. We understand that some, some practices already do this or would have staff that would fulfill this role. Um, that would likely satisfy this requirement, but not all practices are at that point yet. And then the final one is using the IOM care management plan. The other side of this would be the payer participation. So we'd be seeking applications and participation from other payers. Um, understanding that other payers would ha not have the same probably approach to care transformation as us, but we would like them to align as, as much as possible and really be providing financial incentives for those same types of care transformations. The more alignment we have, the easier it'll be for the practices to transform for all their patients. We Medicare and the fee-for-service side cover about 50% of oncology patients, so being able to leverage additional um, payers to cover more of a practice's patient population would make that transition easier and also provide a better value proposition for practices to be able to do this. And getting into more of the nitty gritty of what the episodes would look like. Um, right now we're, pr we're looking at um, including all cancer types. We do understand that there are rare cancers that will be more difficult to price set and we'll be looking at different options and methodologies for, for being able to set episode prices for as many cancers as possible, and then also risk adjusting for a lower levels within a cancer type. The episodes would initiate upon chemotherapy administration. 
and would run for six months. And then we also have the opportunity to renew for additional episode or episodes still under discussion um, for those who are continuing on chemotherapy. We would also include all, all Medicare expenditures in this, so that would be A, B, and D ex Medicare expenditures to get a total cost of care. And the two payment approaches, the two payment types that we're really looking at here are to provide payment ongoing while the practices are providing services. And so this would be a monthly care management fee. Um, we're calling it a per Benny per month payment. And this allows the practices to hire the additional staff and to make those care transformations, provide extended hours, those, those sorts of transformations that would be necessary. They wouldn't have to wait for the back end payment in order to make those changes. And then the second piece of the payment is a performance-based payment. So during the actual performance period, all Medicare fee-for-service payments would be processed as usual, and then we would do a retrospective reconciliation against the target price. So we would be comparing a historical baseline to the performance period and looking for those savings. And then the practice would have the ability to uh, would be eligible for some of that savings. Medicare would be keeping a discount. And then we're also going to be applying a quality multiplier to that uh, savings potential. And that quality multiplier is still in development. We're trying to make sure that we apply payment for the right quality measures, and so that's still under discussion. But essentially, we want to make sure that, that the, the patients are receiving high quality care, that we're having good outcomes and paying related to that. In the next few slides, you'll see that we start listing out the quality measures as we're currently developing them. These are um, not set in stone yet, as none of this model is, but especially in this piece, if people are reviewing these slides and find that we've missed something or over-included something, we're very interested in feedback on those pieces. Also, you'll notice um, the asterisks account for measures that would have to be reported by a practice. And then the bold ones are the ones that we're considering applying to the payment. So this first set here is um, under the domain of clinical quality of care, and they're more disease-specific. Disease and I won't go through each one of them because there's several on the list. Um, and then this next one is communication and care coordination. And you'll notice that these first four here are the ones that we're considering applying payment to. And then this is communication and care coordination continued. We really are trying to get to a place where we can collect a lot of this data through the administrative claims data and so that we would be not, a, not really um, creating an overly harsh burden of data reporting for the practices. We understand that that is problematic. And this next set here is also um, a set of four quality measures that we are considering applying for our quality multiplier. And then the last few here are just our population health ones. And then we have some efficiency and cost reduction, ones where we'd really be looking at utilization to see if our services are, are being utilized in an effective way. But um, it gives us a read on the appropriateness of care and both, on both ends to prevent either a stenting or an overly reduced amount of care or perhaps those who are overly utilizing some of these service, these service areas. And we've thrown out a, a, some discussion questions. As I said before, we're really interested in quality measures and if we've struck the right balance here and if we're, if we're targeting all the right areas. Um, also, one of our interests is making sure that we're setting prices on all, all the right factors. We're considering a, a range of different factors in, in risk adjustments. In the first year, we're really only able to set pricing on, that, on the claims data. And so in, in future years, we'd be looking at things more like staging potentially. But those, that level of data is not currently in our administrative claims data, so wouldn't be able to truly benchmark that. So looking for other, other ways of doing that. And then also from the other payer perspective, 
what opportunities are there here and what challenges would they face and potentially attempting to align with a model that looks like this.